The President has also received the following letter from Senator McKim. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today the Australian Greens propose to move that in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. Labor's second budget is a betrayal of the people promised that no one will be left behind. Yours sincerely, Nick McKim. Uh, is the proposal supported? Excellent. Uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerk will set the clock in line with the formal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the fact that Labor's budget is a betrayal of too many people who were promised that no one would be left behind. This budget is the first since the tabling of the report of the Select Committee on Work and Care, which I chaired. The government's first chance to address its 33 recommendations, a report that's a majority report, where senators from Labor worked really hard alongside me uh, to bring those recommendations to this parliament for action. Labor supported them in full, and the committee took evidence from people all around the country. We recommended a comprehensive and integrated approach to addressing the challenges of work and care in this country. Uh, action that would address the broken parts of our care economy and properly support the workers who make up so many of the women now our work, in our workforce responsible for others while they're holding down a job most days of the week. These challenges have only got worse in the months since our report was tabled. The housing crisis has become much worse. The cost of living crisis is run away in our cities and our towns. So this budget was a chance to squarely address the challenges that our committee work revealed. This was their chance to make sure working carers weren't left behind. So how do we evaluate the budget in terms of uh, that issue, who's been left behind? Let's start with a couple of bright spots. Firstly, the change to single parents' payments, which reverses the Gillard government's act of cruelty 10 years ago, forcing so many single parents, mostly mothers, onto job seeker uh, when their child turned not 16 but just eight. That's a, a bright spot for sure. But incredibly, they were unable, they couldn't bring themselves to actually fully fix their mistake of 10 years ago. They've left 15,000 families parents of 14- and 15-year-olds on JobSeeker living in poverty, um, and just 80 million of that 2.4 billion surplus would have addressed that question and fully fixed their mistake under the Gillard government 10 years ago. Shame. That is a really serious uh, error to have left those families behind. A second bright spot, though, that I want to mention is the allocation of $11 billion to a 15 per cent pay rise for aged care workers, which our committee recommended and support. Also very good. But it's worth reminding ourselves that Labor had to be pushed to meet its obligation on this front. It tried to stretch the 15 per cent pay rise to be paid over two years, but unions were outraged about this attempt to stall the full wage increase and they had to fight to make sure that aged care workers, overworked, underpaid, no career structure, leaving in the droves from the industry, weren't left behind by this budget. So against those bright spots, where are we on the broader set of recommendations that our committee made? Firstly, our report recommended a pay rise for all care workers, for childcare workers and disability workers. They are left waiting and they are facing a crisis in their workforce. Beyond pay, we re recommended a significant investment in 100 new childcare care centres, desperately needed in childcare deserts across our country, still waiting. We recommended the government find a pathway towards 52 weeks paid parental leave, the international standard on paid parental leave, which Australian women living in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet have a right to expect, still missing, left behind. There's much more that our inquiry re recommended that's missing from this budget. Free childcare, an increase in benefits that take people out of poverty, not a $2.85 increase in job seeker, less than a loaf of bread. There's so much more to be done in work and care. Much of it was affordable in a budget, held back by a fetish about the surplus and choices made by Labor, Labor's choices to put going easy on the tax industry and taxing them properly over the welfare of working carers. Choices. Choices that put submarines before our kids' welfare. Choices that put the stage three tax cuts in front of making childcare free, 
paying carers what they deserve and lifting our paid parental leave to the international standard. There's so much to be done in reform of our workplace relations system. We're going to be working on that from the Greens' perspective to push further and faster for job security for so many of our workers. So this budget has left too many things undone. At a time when we could have gone much further, especially for the most vulnerable, we have to stop running our economy on the underpaid work of carers and the overwork of those who hold down jobs while they juggle their kids and all kinds of care. We must do better. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this urgency motion, and uh, it's rare that I, I stand here uh, speaking on a Greens urgency motion, and I do agree with the words of the urgency motion that the government has betrayed Australians. They have betrayed Australians, perhaps not in the same way as the Greens would characterise that betrayal, but the betrayal that I see most starkly is the betrayal of refusing to confront in this budget and in last year's budget the scourge of inflation. The scourge of inflation. Inflation is a secret hidden tax on every Australian. Whether you've got $10 in the bank or $1,000 in the bank or $100,000 in the bank, inflation makes you poorer. It reduces the spending power of the money you have. And if you are one of those people who needs to spend everything that they earn or that they receive in benefits, then inflation is a curse. Make no mistake. Inflation is a betrayal. And any government that fails to tackle inflation seriously and leaves all the heavy lifting in the inflation space up to the Reserve Bank is betraying Australians, every Australian, from the, the, the poorest Australians to the wealthiest Australian. It is a betrayal of our nation. It is a betrayal of every business in this country. It erodes the buying power of every Australian. It means when they go to the shops, the, what their purchasing power is reduced. The basket of goods they can buy is smaller. It means when they go to fill up their car at the petrol station in the face of very high petrol costs, they also face inflationary costs. That means the value of the dollar in their pocket is less, which means instead of putting in a full tank of fuel, people are having to make the decision to put in half a tank of fuel. It leads to massive declines in real wages. And this is something I will dwell on because those opposite those opposite keep insisting they are the champions of the workers, when in actual fact the record is very clear and the record is very stark that they are betraying, they are betraying every worker in this country through not tackling the curse of inflation. Throughout the period of the last coalition government, uh, contrary to the myths spread by those opposite, real wages actually grew. Real wages grew until we were hit by a once-in-the-century pandemic. Real wages grew under the coalition government. And what did we see with a government that uh, the Labor government came in, failed to tackle the curse of inflation, and we see real wages plummeting. The decline in the December quarter was four and a half per cent. A four and a half per cent decline in real wages in this country. A decline not seen in decades. And that is what inflation does. And that why that is why the failure of this government to tackle inflation in this budget, to tackle the scourge of inflation in this budget, is the ultimate betrayal of every Australian family, of every Australian business, of every Australian voter. And let's hear what some, some serious economists said about this Labor budget, because it's not just me saying this, it's not just those of us on this side of the chamber saying this. Stephen Anthony, Managing Director at Macroeconomic Advisory. This was Jim Chalmers' chance to really cut. 
In fact, he's a net spender. Over his two documents so far, his two budgets over the last 12 months, he's making life harder for the RBA and for working Australians because he's not getting to the meat of the problem. Chris Richardson from Rich Insights. If you wanted to do all the fairness stuff and at the same time keep the Reserve Bank on the bench, I'd say you need to take some tough decisions. And by and large, we haven't seen those tough decisions. I'd have thought after the surprise rate rise from the Reserve Bank last month that they were done and dusted. I'm less clear now that that's the case. And I have four or five other quotes from economists demonstrating that this government has failed completely to tackle inflation, and that is the ultimate betrayal. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Sheldon. Well, I was going to give a different speech, but I actually might give another one in light of the fact of just uh, that speech we just heard, because in light of um, the, the Greens uh, MPI, um, but the comments made before are just quite alarming. Like to think that, of course, there is nobody in this room that does not, in this Senate, that does not see that inflation is an important thing for us all to tackle. But to suggest that there is no policy initiative other than saying it's important to tackle is the only thing we should be doing. Because what they've actually done across the way and what they've been saying for a very long time when they were in government, because during the federal election, when you start talking about cost of living, what they don't understand, the cost of living is turning around and making sure that you have the capacity to pay for the costs that you're bearing. And that's why the important changes that were made by Labor during, uh, in the industrial relations field and the workplace relations field has been so critically important. But before the election, they wouldn't even support a dollar increase an hour to the least lowest paid workers in this economy. When they refused to turn around and support it. And they still won't break ranks. You know, the Prime Minister has gone, he's about to go, go, go out of the seat of Cook, and still they won't break ranks. He made the right decision. They still hold it to their heart. Cost of living is about a precept. It's about an actual idea about the fact how much money some people are making and how much little money others are forced to make. Now, you look at the situation with the campaign during the 2022 federal election, the Liberal and National Party refused to commit to funding the aged care pay order made by the Fair Work Commission. We just did. We just did in this election. So when they start talking about what needs to change, what they're really saying is they still stick with their old policies. Because if someone's going to pay for it, the ones that are going to pay for it are the ones that can at least afford to pay for it. Largely feminised industries like the care industry. Well, we've paid and we've budgeted that and we've turned around and made sure that we've put the money towards that 15 per cent wage increase, which is critical, critical to the Australian economy, to the, to the public, and also to give value back into the aged care sector. Now, I always think about you know, when they start talking about inflation and what that means, what they're really saying is that you don't matter, because inflation we know, and everybody in here knows inflation is important. But what they're really saying, for example, the former Assistant Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Stoker, said at the Senate estimates in 2021 that if gig workers are earning less than the minimum wage, then that's their choice because they entered into the contract. That's what they think. You can never get paid too less. How do you deal with the cost of living? You can never get paid too little, as far as they're concerned, on the opposite side. And of course, at the Senate Cost of Living Committee hearing on the 1st of March of this year, Senator Hume claimed that wages and working conditions are irrelevant to the cost of living. Now, that's what you've got to say when people get up here and start saying what the importance are to in, in tackling inflation. Because actually they're not about tackling inflation at all. They're not about tackling cost of living. They're about turning around and making sure that they look after some certain particular interests. Now, the tripling of the bulk billing incentives for GPs has been critical. Increasing job seeker for $40, $40 per fortnight is a step in the right direction. Providing $500 to help with power bills for more than 5 million households is a step in the right direction. The Commonwealth rental assistance increase by 15 per cent is a step in the right direction. Delivering on the surplus for the first time in 15 years and reducing the deficit is important because it talks about our capacity for programs in the future. The things that many of us, not all of us, but many of us actually hold dear in this place. 
you know, delivering an extra $2 billion for social and affordable housing is critical. They are critical steps. Building a national emergency management stockpile, making multinational companies pay more in fair share of tax, supporting small business with cash flow support and extending the instant asset write-off. And there's a lot more. There's more and more and more. I've only got 37 seconds left. But what I tell you what we should say is that part of this important program forward is making sure that we've got money for affordable housing. It's a step forward. That is cruelly critical. Building more homes by enabling an additional $2 billion in investment for more social and affordable housing is critical. And the power housing described it as a transformative reform that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. The Housing Industry Association said we have to put something in place right now. The National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past, forward for the past 10 years. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Grogan. Thank you. This really is quite the fascinating debate. I think if you'd sat in this place over the course of the last decade under the coalition government, particularly in those dying years, it would have been pretty easy to forget what good government actually looks like. So we do understand how confused you are when you look at the budget that was delivered yesterday and you see a balanced and sensible budget. We get that. But hang around long enough and maybe you'll learn something. Good government is all about pulling the right levers at the right time, making sure we balance all of the various areas of the budget. And as the Treasurer said last night, we've sought in all decisions to strike a considered and methodical balance. We need to exercise restraint and to keep the pressure off inflation. But we also need to help those people out there who are struggling, ensuring that vital services like Medicare and NDIS are delivered to those Australians who need them. Labor has delivered a, a budget that, that relieves that pressure. We've delivered a budget that is meaningful and that has significant cost of living relief for Australian households. Now, Senator Sheldon has given a good list of the kind of things we have uh, in that budget to assist Australians, including their power bills, health costs, supporting vulnerable Australians, creating more affordable housing and boosting wages. And regardless of the stunts and the grandstanding that we've seen today uh, in this place, ordinary Australians are relieved to have seen a balanced budget that will genuinely make a difference to their lives. We don't pretend that everything has been fixed here at all. Not in any of the commentary yesterday are we claiming that we've reached some sort of utopia. But on the back of the chaos that we have seen and on the back of the challenges within the budget, when we came to government, the things that we have had to fix, we have taken that first significant step that will fix the challenges that we see in this country over some time. Now, I have been on the um, select committee into the cost of living over the last number of months. And what became very clear to me in the first raft of, sitting, of, of hearings for that committee was that the Labor government inherited climbing energy prices due in large part to the energy policy chaos from those opposite. And so we confirmed that with the expert witnesses and the witnesses with lived experience. We also saw quite clearly from the housing experts and the housing peaks that the Labor government inherited a dramatic housing supply shortage, in part due to the inaction of those opposite. On every level, in every function of that committee, we have seen that this crisis claimed by those around me that was popped up miraculously on the 21st of May last year, that no, this was about long-term structural problems that had been baked into the budget by chaos and inattention and ideological beliefs. One of the things that is really critical and topical today, obviously, as we desperately try and debate the Housing Affordability Future Fund, 
is where we're going on housing. It's such a critical issue. We need to do more on housing, and Labor government is aiming to do more on housing, but we are getting blocked by our colleagues in this place. And who's standing in the way? The Liberal Party, the National Party, the Greens Party. One lot thinks that 10 billion investment is too small to be worth the effort, and so they'd rather have nothing. And the others think it's too easy to mismanage a $10 billion housing fund. Well, newsflash, you may be the rotting pinnacle of Australian politics, but we are Labor and we are in government and there would be no mismanagement of that fund. <laughs> housing Australia Future Fund is a critical nation-building fund and that will deliver critical housing that we need, <coughs> that we desperately need in this country. And right now we are standing in this chamber with each of the other political parties the Liberal Party, the National Party, the Greens Party, intending to block $10 billion in Thank housing. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, in a cost of living crisis, the women in this country demanded and deserved bold action from this new government. And instead, we got more of the same half measures and more of the spin that we saw in the October budget. One of the most heartbreaking things in the budget last night, for me as the Green spokesperson on women, was that the government continues to ignore the calls from frontline domestic and family violence response services for enough funding so that they don't have to turn people away who seek their help. The government is continuing to ignore those calls, and those, the sector has been making those calls for nigh a year. They have been calling for a billion dollars every year so that they don't have to turn away people who seek their help. Now, the funding shortfall that was delivered last night will see uh, one in three women not able to get the help that they need. Women, children, people fleeing from violence, one in three of them will not be funded to get the help that they need. Those services will be underfunded. And while Labor continues to underfund those domestic and family violence support services, and while victim survivors are continue to be turned away from crisis accommodation or told by the legal helpline, I'm sorry, we just don't have enough staff to help to advise you, one woman is murdered every 10 days in this country. Now, the government has spoken about difficult choices in the lead-up to the budget, but many women are now facing an impossible choice—stay in an unsafe home or leave and put themselves and their kids at risk of homelessness. Women are choosing between violence or homelessness, and this government had the opportunity last night to fix that. And instead, they kept uh, $254 billion in tax cuts to wealthy white blokes, while women and children fleeing violence are not going to get the help they need to keep them safe. That is an active choice by this government, and I was absolutely gutted to see that they refused to give those frontline prevention and response services the funding they need to save women's lives. What can be more important than that? Now, it's not just the Greens that are saying this. A number of media commentators um, and all of the fabulous feminist advocates and women's safety advocates, including Renee Carr um, from Fair Agenda, who says, um, we welcome the $723 million, but it still falls short of the billion that we need. Many women will be left without the support that they need to be safe and recover from violence. She says, we know that specialist services can make a life-saving and life-changing difference to women trying to escape violence or recover from sexual assault, but they need to be resourced. Well, you had your chance. How dare you condemn women into poverty and into violence and homelessness while dishing out money for submarines, fossil fuels, wealthy white guys and property investors? Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister promised his government would leave no one behind. Yesterday's budget showed the opposite. It left behind refugees and asylum seekers. Those on welfare payments as a small increase is welcome but insufficient. People with disabilities, First Nations people seeking justice, homeless people, people on the public housing waiting lists, people on low incomes, renters without rent assistance and students. We're in a cost of living crisis which affects struggling families and communities who are battling. 
Yet this government, a Labor government supposedly representing the working class, is more concerned with providing tax cuts to the rich than housing, food and support for those who need it. Senator Shoebridge. I wanted to put the words of a young person on the record in this parliament because they're the ones with most to lose from a budget that doesn't invest in the future or indeed in the present. Everyone's talking about who wins and loses out of the budget. So let's have a look at and thank let's, so let's have a look at that and thank you to Taylor Tran uh, for, the, for these words. Young people, you win because hex loans will rise 7.1% in June. You also get $2.85 extra in your pocket in job seeker and youth allowance to tackle the cost of living crisis and an extra $24 to pay your rent. You're welcome. The government promised they wouldn't leave you behind. Women, you win most of all. There's no new funding for access to contraception and abortion, which are two key benchmarks of the national women's health strategy. You didn't need it anyway. People in the arts, you win. A few million will be funnelled into our institutions of art, like the National Gallery, and a few more will go into attracting big budget screen productions into our backyards so you can be employed. Never mind the fact that it still costs an arm and a leg to study art at tertiary level under the Job Ready Graduates package. The government hasn't left you behind, so if you can afford to graduate, you win. The environment you won last night as well, never mind the fact that we should be aiming for net zero emissions by 2030. This budget delivers $11 billion for fossil fuel subsidies and just breadcrumbs for national parks. Apparently, we can have a just transition away from fossil fuels without spending any money. Just don't ask how. Don't forget stage three tax cuts are still on the table and the research shows that the economy is far from flourishing at the moment. So really the Labor government's budget hasn't left anybody behind, not at all. Not unless you're talking about young people, students, women's health, the environment or the arts. Thank you, Taylor, for speaking truth to power in this debate. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I thank Senator McKim for this motion, which I support. The Albanese Chalmers government is indeed leaving people behind. This budget leaves behind everyday Australians struggling to make their mortgage or rental payment, struggling with rising electricity bills and rising grocery bills. This budget leaves agricultural and rural communities behind. This budget leaves small business behind. This budget leaves heavy industry and manufacturing behind. And this budget leaves the mining industry, mining communities and mining workers behind. Last night, the Treasurer repeatedly acknowledged the surplus came from increased revenue for the things we export, without once mentioning what those things are. Treasurer, say the name, mining, agriculture. These are paying for increased assistance to Australians in the budget. If the pool is not large enough to help everyone, One Nation has a simple solution, proven. Invest in productive infrastructure, drive, in, drive business growth and expand the pie so all Australians can save and have more. Thank you. Senator Steele, John. Last night's budget did not meet the needs of the disability community. Through a combination of their 8 per cent cap on the NDIS and so-called effectiveness measures, the Labor Party is moving over $74 billion, ripping it out of our NDIS over the decade. Disabled people see this as a stab in the back. It is a broken promise from a government and a minister who promised that they would uh, work in co-design on the big decisions. And it is a massive diversion from the road of reform and review that we were travelling down together in relation to the NDIS. The Greens are incredibly concerned that there was not a single dollar put towards implementing the recommendations of the Disability Royal Commission that will be handed to the government in September. Shame! And we are incredibly concerned and joined with the community in fury and frustration that DSP was not raised across the board, that those on the disability support pension, most of them have been left behind in the budget. Well, the Greens are committed to working with the disability community to push back, to get this cap scrapped, to block any and all cuts 
Together, we established our NDIS. Together, we defeated the Morrison government in relation to independent assessments. And together, together we will defeat this Labour government if they attempt to cap or to cut our NDIS. Senator Ormond Payne. Billions to the rich, subsidies to coal and gas, and rhetoric for the rest. The PM said that this would be a Labor budget. Well, I guess we now know what that really means. It seems that Labor has abandoned the economic base of their party just so they can win a petty argument with radio shock jocks over delivering a surplus. Rest easy, debt hawks. Your nest is safe with the Labor Party. I hope the victory lap for a Tory campaign slogan was worth it because there are thousands of people in this country who were starving last night, and after the budget, they still will be. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. That of the, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the uh, ayes have it, the noes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pocock on behalf of Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Mine has <coughs> order. There being 37 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. There you go. I just ask senators if they're not participating in the next few items, just leave the chamber quietly.